Hi, I'm Sam Mangelko. I'm the president of the Southern California chapter of EERI. Um, thank you all for coming. It's it's great to see you out here. I know it's not easy to get to these events sometimes in downtown Los Angeles, but I'm glad you're here. Um, I have the pleasure tonight of introducing an old friend of mine um, back 20 some years ago when I was a young graduate student at Cal. Very shy, very thin <laughs> person. Um, I had the pleasure of working at the Shake Table, for my first job in grad school. And we built a concrete column with a lot of weight on it. And a lot of that weight was lead, which we were handling with our gloved hands, which I don't think would be legal now. <laughs> so Ken was very good to me. He was the lead on that project. We had a great time. And uh, Introduced me about my first experience at shaking and breathing like that. So uh, that was great. And I just want to point out some of Ken's history. He has an illustrious career uh, starting out at the uh, University of British Columbia, where he got his Bachelor of Arts in Science in 1993. Moved on to the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign in 1995 and received his PhD in civil engineering at Berkeley in 2002. Um, he joined the University of Auckland in July 2014 after 11 years on the faculty at the University of British Columbia. He served as a member of several international code committees and sits on the American Concrete Institute building the CI 318 committee. He served as an art role director of the Teharenga Ru Wake Forest Center for Earthquake Resilience, a New Zealand government funded center for research excellence. And he's starting a new phase in his career now. Um, he's going to be a multi-year second I don't know if you're... <laughs> to the New Zealand government to serve as the MBIE EQC Chief Engineer for Building Resilience. That's a big deal. Uh, congratulations, by the way. <laughs> so I look forward to introducing Ken. Um, please enjoy the talk. It'll be very informative. All right, thanks. Um, I realized uh, it's a, a tiny bit out of date. I'm no longer on ACI 318. Um, <laughs> not that I was kicked off, or I don't think I was. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and, um, and the secondment is a, is a word that uh, apparently doesn't exist in uh, US English. Uh, it's uh, basically I'm on loan to the government uh, for 80% for of my time. Um, and, uh, and I'll explain that just in a moment, but I do want to clarify that this isn't a typo here. Uh, this is the 2022 uh, Distinguished Lecture. Um, and I, um, and I, I, I first gave this at the uh, National Conference in Salt Lake City last year. A couple of you were, were there. Uh, and uh, so I apologize you having to see this twice. Um, but there have been a few tweaks since. Um, and, uh, and then I've tried to come back from New Zealand to give it a few times. This is probably my last time with this particular talk, uh, but it's been a wonderful experience and I appreciate being invited here to Southern California. You know, so much of the great earthquake engineering challenges are here in a place like Los Angeles. And, uh, you're, you're the ones who are, who are facing those challenges. So. Uh, it's good to, to be here and be able to have a discussion with you about uh, some of these ideas. So this uh, um, branch of this ministry is, is a regulator for the, for the building code um, and uh, also funded by EQC, uh, EQC. and um, they provide the uh, residential uh, public insurance for all residential properties in New Zealand. So this is like your CAE. Uh, here in California. Um, I was really drawn to this role because I've always been uh, someone who was motivated in my research by being uh, close to practice. It's the challenges of the practice that, that motivate me when I do in research. Uh, but this gave me the opportunity to sort of bring in what I think is the, the third point in the triangle, and that's policy. Uh, I did not have experience in policy, uh, but that's essentially what these organizations do. And so to, uh, to be embedded in there and be an advisor 
to them as their developing policy is, is wonderful. Uh, it just so happened that I accepted this position within one week of being off, offered by EERI to give the distinguished lecture. And uh, I thought this couldn't be a coincidence. I, I should use this as an opportunity to sort of think through what I might be able to uh, do in this role over the next uh, six years, the six years of common. Um, and so that's sort of what this uh, uh, talk is about, um, thinking through uh, the possibilities for the future. Uh, but I have to emphasize, these are just the crazy musings of a professor and not New Zealand government policy. All right? Uh, who knows? Maybe in the future. But at this time, these are just, just my ideas. Uh, it's going to be an issue. <laughs> um, I want to give acknowledgement to, of course, EDRI for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, all of my graduate students um, over the many years have inspired their work. But in particular, I have two postdocs, Anne Halsey and Tayo Pupula, uh, or had two postdocs, uh, who really did a lot of the heavy lifting for this for the work in this talk. Uh, and so I, uh, I credit them for a lot of it. You'll see their names throughout. Um, and, and then I talked to many of, uh, several of you actually, uh, as I uh, developed this talk and got lots of really valuable uh, data and insights. Um, and uh, a lot of it is inspired by a project that I've been doing with ATC, uh, which is developing guidelines for poster between assessment and, and repair. Uh, and I took ideas from that and then thought about how they applied in a new design. Uh, content. And so I really credit the conversations that we've had as a team. Santiago has been on that team, John has been on that team, and I really appreciated all the um, uh, back and forth and learning from that group. Of course, I have to uh, um, thank all of the funding sources as we try this again. Okay. Fingers crossed. Keep going. All right. Um, so uh, the key objective of this talk and my view is to think about some possible changes to code minimum building design, um, primarily in terms of drifts and loads, uh, deformation limits, uh, in light of the impacts that we've seen in recent years. Okay? And I'm specifically focusing on the code minimum uh, because this is going to have the greatest impact on the greatest number of buildings in terms of raising the resilience of our communities. And trying to lay out these possible changes, I want to, first of all, recognize the inherent uncertainties in seismic performance. So we have to think about probability a little bit. Um, but even though we're dealing with uncertainties which can be complex, we want to make the implementation as simple as possible. But no simple. But the reason here is we want it as simple as possible for the greatest uptake possible. Um, but earthquake performance, the performance of buildings and earthquakes is complex. We have to recognize that we can't dumb it down too much. We actually want it to be a relatively small increment of change. And you may say to me, well, you have an opportunity, dream big. Why are you just going for small? Well, if it's a small increment of change, it has a greater chance of actually being taken up, right? And having an impact. That's what that's what it's about. And then I want to demonstrate that many of the buildings out there that we design today are already repairable after design or close to it. And so with that in mind, this concept of a repairable design or repairability-based design is not far-fetched. Okay, so those are the basic objectives. I'll come back to some of that uh, at the end of the talk. So this is all to be inspired by what we see in past earthquakes, right? And so um, let's think about sort of how our codes have, have evolved over the years. Um, and sort of in the, in the good old days, uh, the uh, building to design improvement cycle might look like this. The earthquake happens. Um, we go out, we see the performance of that building, focusing primarily on the structural initially, 
And, and this was really all led by the, the, the work of uh, EERI and the LFE Learning from Earthquakes program. Um, and from those observations, we say, what changes to building design will improve that structural performance that we just saw in that past? And for me, uh, this led to our, what we have today, the way we design codes today, which I'll maybe call ductility-based design principles, really embodied within ADC3 uh, way back in the 70s. And that was really inspired by this earthquake, which of course, here in Southern California in 1971, San Fernando earthquake went out and saw the whole new hospital. And I can imagine the engineers thinking, oh, it'd be great if we could spread that nonlinear behavior away from the first story up to the building, spread that inelasticity into the beams. Um, and, uh, and even within this building, we saw that the benefits of detailing, of confinement, how you can actually get some deformation capacity out of our concrete. And here we even see how uh, health and safety has changed over the years. Eh? Um, certainly wouldn't uh, have somebody approaching the building like that without your hard hat and high vis these days. Um, so things have changed. And now I think we've recognized that this building design improvement cycle, as they've called it, is a bit more complex. And when we look at building performance, we focus a lot more on non-structural now, but really what we focus on are the impacts from the earthquake. And we're going to categorize those as economic, environmental, and social. All right? And LFE, learning from earthquakes, has still been central to this process. Now we ask ourselves, what sort of changes to our building design process are necessary to manage those future impacts? Um, so to answer that question, I first want to reflect on what the impacts have uh, been observed from, from recent earthquakes. Um, and then I'll come back to, well, what can we do in the design of our buildings to, to try to manage them? And I'm going to talk about an earthquake that's near and dear to my heart uh, because I was right in the middle of that dust cloud uh, uh, on February 22nd, 2011. Um, and you're probably familiar with uh, some of the direct uh, outcomes of so the 185 fatalities, uh, the uh, closure, the CBE being uh, closed from, by a cordon for over two years. Um, the over 170,000 residential properties uh, damaged. But what I really want to focus on are the overall impacts. And as I said, I'm going to categorize these as uh, economic, environmental, or social. Um, and uh, I've just uh, given a few examples of impacts under those, under those categories with some specific examples from, from price choose. I'm not going to read through all of those, but let me just highlight uh, a handful of them that I think uh, particularly are relevant to building and performance. And all of these have some indirect relationship with building performance. But let me highlight a few in particular. For instance, on the economic side, um, commercial office space. The commercial office space in Christchurch dropped uh, 75% uh, right off of the bat. Um, and uh, that remained at that level even beyond the time that the cordon was in place um, and never really fully came back and took quite, quite a few years. Uh, tourism accommodation, you can see the uh, accommodation in hotels dropped off rapidly and took many, many years to come back and probably is not still not back at uh, pre-earthquake uh, levels. I'm very pleased about these motels up here because uh, you know that's where the engineers went to stay in those two-story wood frame motels around the city uh, as they went out and, uh, and uh, um, inspected uh, damaged buildings. Um, uh, and then there were many, many demolitions in uh, Credit Street. In fact, over 60% of the concrete buildings in Christchurch were demolished after the earthquake. And, you know, if we think about that in today's context of uh, thinking about carbon and carbon targets, that's an incredible impact. It's the carbon equivalent of about 500 
thousand flights between Los Angeles and New York. Uh, that's uh, a significant amount of carbon. Um, the damage in those buildings was not all significant. Uh, and this, these charts down here show um, the damage ratios along the bottom, uh, and the orange bars are the number of uh, demolished buildings. So you can see from both wall frames and shear walls that a significant number of uh, buildings with actually relatively low damage ratios were demolished. So there's clearly other stuff playing into this than just building performance, right? In fact, the demolition decision process is a complex thing, and we could do a whole other hour lecture just on that. Uh, but let me just say that, that there, uh, there are lots of things that come into play here. There is really the, the whole characteristics of the building, the ownerships, and, and its insurance policy prior to the earthquake. The earthquake itself, of course, causes the damage. But then if we've also got issues of what's the access like to the building, um, what are the neighborhood conditions? Do you still want to build back there? And then you go into this stage that I call the uh, vortex of complexity, uh, because there's all kinds of stuff going on here, including, and particularly important in the New Zealand context, was insurance, because there is this very high insurance penetration in New Zealand. But still, the uncertainty about the residual capacity of these buildings even with that light levels of damage, uh, played a significant role in, in the outcome. And so leading to this large number of demolitions. But I want to highlight there are also a large number of unresolved cases, essentially buildings that remain empty five, 10 years on. Um, so this is a, a map of the 45 barrier sites that five years on from the earthquake were, were still left empty um, and uh, unresolved. And then uh, some 10 years on, there were still 30 of these that were still not addressed. Um, and these included some of the really larger concrete buildings in Christchurch. Um, in fact, this one up here is the, the most tagged building in Christchurch. Maybe not tagged uh, compared to some buildings in LA, but still tagged nonetheless. And there is uh, a whole social impact of that because of squatters in the area. Uh, it caused uh, impact on property value around the building. So there's undoubtedly social issues that come from these buildings remaining empty and abandoned for so many years. What does barrier sites mean? Barrier, thank you. The barrier refers to barriers to development. Uh, barriers to redevelopment of the central business district. And what did you mean by insurance penetration? Uh, there's a, uh, so a lot of the buildings in uh, Christchurch had insurance, earthquake insurance, that would cover them in, in the case of damage. Whereas uh, not all buildings here in Los Angeles would have that. Um, speaking of well-being, um, there is a great survey that was done, uh, a longitudinal survey that was done over many years after the earthquake, uh, asking people about what was impacted their, their well-being, their everyday lives. And so what I've plotted here are all issues which have a moderate or major negative impact on people's lives. Okay. And I don't expect you to read all of this at the bottom of what those issues were, because I've already sorted them for you. All the red ones are related to building damage in some way. Okay, The gray ones are not directly related to building damage. And so what we can see from that is that the building performance is, is, is really it's having the highest impact on people, uh, on their lives, uh, causing stress, decreasing well-being. Um, and so this indicates that um, by improving building performance, maybe we can, we can improve the well-being of people. That, that, that intuitively, of course, makes sense, but it's nice to have the data. There's also a well-being issue that comes from the widespread injuries and fatalities that happen in the earthquake. And this is a great study by Northpool et al. where they collected an incredible data set of injuries after the earthquake. 
Um, and uh, you can see that many of these come from falls or contents or strains as people moved. Um, and so perhaps those should come to be dealt more by public education. Um, whereas uh, the over here clearly demonstrates that it is structural performance that is uh, most, uh, um, most directly causes the, injury, the serious injuries and fatalities, which of course intuitively makes sense, but good to have data to support that. Okay, so the building design uh, and the building performance is really still very, very important to uh, being able to manage uh, and reduce those, those serious injuries uh, in future events. Okay, so we've talked about some of these uh, different um, uh, impacts. Uh, I'm just showing a few, just some examples here. And all of them, I think I've tried to demonstrate that these are complex. It's not just simply building performance or building damage, but building damage is part of all of these. Okay? And so now I'm going to shift my attention to what we can do about building design uh, that can help it, uh, manage these outcomes through managing the building damage side. Okay? And I'm going to do this in the context of the New Zealand building. Apologies. But I think there's enough commonalities that you'll be able to relate. Okay, so let me just um, I'll walk you through a few basics of the New Zealand building. So the New Zealand building code actually has two relevant objectives to, to the building performance. One is to safeguard people from injury caused by structural failure, injury meaning both uh, non-fatal and fatal injury, so that's life safety. Um, and to safeguard people from loss of amenity caused by structural behavior. Amenity, that's a bit of a funny word. Uh, it's actually defi uh, defined as shown here by, by the building code. But if I were reading that in today's context, I'd probably say that's really talking about building function. Okay? So we've really got functionality built into our building code already as, as objective. And these are addressed within our design standards through two limit states or design targets, okay? an ultimate limit state and a serviceability limit state. Okay? The ultimate limit state is very much like your design basis earthquake, uh, typical design here in, in the US. Okay? It's, it's a one in 500 year uh, event, a 500 year return period, if you will. Um, and, uh, and you have a check on ductility and you have a check on uh, drift. Um, and then there's a serviceability limit state. That's a quite a small earthquake, only a 25 year uh, return period. And based on those two together, we end up with uh, really the ultimate limit state controlling in the vast majority of cases. Okay, so in that sense, it really is very, very similar to what you do here in the US. Uh, it is controlled by that design basis. All right, but we'll talk about both of these uh, in, the, uh, in the following slides. So now I want to relate those building code objectives to those impacts that we talked about that we've observed after past weekends. And really that safeguard from loss of amenity, as I said, that's only totally addressed by SLS, by the serviceability limit savior or an objective of continued function. Um, and if we do that, we're really addressing these impacts here about business closures and housing damage and, and to an extent well-being. Um, the, the ULS, the ultimate limit state, protecting life is, is really addressing, of course, the serious fatalities and injuries. And, um, but there seems to be something missing, right? This waste. The, the, the carbon cost, the empty buildings are not really addressed. And it makes me think that maybe we need another objective in here, something related to climate change. Um, and perhaps that's a design target around enabling repair. Okay? So I'm now going to go through the rest of the talk and select design loads and drift loads 
that are, are related to each of these. Okay? I'm going to start with the easiest one down here that we're most familiar with. Come back to talk about the function in SLS here, and I'll end with uh, the more the new newer one about enabling repair. But first, I just want to make sure that we're all familiar with this uh, sort of risk targeted concept. That uh, and, and of course, this is what's used in, in the U.S. for setting the, the design loads. Uh, so. Um, it is uh, probably going to be quite familiar to you. It is not familiar to uh, us in New Zealand, uh, but it's good to just make sure we're all on the same footing. All right, the traditional approach is you've got a hazard curve that comes from these guys here at SCEC, um, and uh, you pick off your return period. In the case of uh, New Zealand, that's 500 years, and that's your design essay. Uh, but of course, what if you had a hazard curve that went through that same point, but in a slightly different shape? Why are you picking that one value? Well, the risk targeted approach basically says, I've got a, a building that has an uncertain behavior, uncertain performance that maybe can be represented by a fragility curve. And um, I can integrate those together. Um, and and I, I was told I could have one equation. So this is my one equation, although I apologize for it being slightly uh, hidden. Um, anyhow, you integrate those two together and you get the risk. Okay, basically the area under that curve is the risk. And perhaps with the, way, the position I have chosen for that fragility curve, perhaps you'd say, oh, that risk is a little high. High relative to my target. I'll come back and talk about my target. But let's just say it's high relative to my target. Then you can take that fragility curve and shift it over. And so you match that tar target and say, that's better. And now that fragility curve now defines the building I want to design. The next question is, is what value do you actually design for on that fragility curve? You here in the US, you pick the 10% value off of that. That's what you design. Uh, another way to do that is to say, we think that buildings have a roughly uh, collapse margin ratio of, say, four or five, something like that. And just say, from the median, you shift it back by that collapse margin ratio, and that's your design. Say. They're essentially equivalent. It's just choosing a different axis by which to pick off my design. OK, so that's a risk-targeted approach. And in our latest consideration of our national seismic hazard model and bringing that into our code, we've um, considered this, but taken a slightly different approach. What we've done is said, really what we've got is a tolerable risk range. We don't really know what that risk value is. Uh, that uh, in the US IDC says 1% probability of collapse 50 years. Where does that come from? Magical. Um, in fact, we want to do it in terms of annual, annual individual fatalities. Um, and why? Because we can relate that to other life risks. Other sectors use fatality risk in their, their decision. So that's perhaps a, a more useful value. That roughly translates into a collapse risk that is lower than what is used here in the US. Um, that feels a bit more comfortable in the New Zealand context. Um, and how do we choose this range? Well, it's really based on the precedent. Uh, and this, again, is looking at other sectors uh, in development and um, land use, uh, in uh, use of uh, even the hiking trails in New Zealand, they think about uh, fatality risk. Um, and you look at this, it's sort of all over the map. But generally, we see this sort of tolerable range between about 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to the minus 6. Okay? And so when we assess our fatality risk, we'd like to be in about that range. So that's what we've done. We've chosen that 1 in 500 uh, hazard. Um, and we've chosen a range of possible fragilities that represent new buildings. Because new buildings are not just one. 
utility. There's a, not all new buildings are created. Uh, and we can back calculate this fatality. Now, there are certainly many assumptions involved in getting to this point, um, but it's a consistent assumption. And then we look at that uh, and overlay that tolerable range I was just talking about. And we see for all of these cities that we tend to be falling in that tolerable range. And that feels about right. That gives us comfort to, to continue to use that one in 500 year uh, hazard for our design of our new buildings. Okay, so that gives us our, um, our, our strength for, for that we need to satisfy the ultimate limits. Uh, now I want to turn to talk about function, okay? Uh, but before I do that, I want to just acknowledge uncertainty. I think this is really important. Um, that when we start talking about these different risk metrics, um, uh, as we look at increasing damage, our estimate in of that risk metric is the uncertainty in that risk metric is going to go up as damage increases. Makes sense. As damage increases, the behavior of the building, there's a lot more uncertainty as to what's happening. So if we say that loss of function is that risk metric, then perhaps we want to be looking at a design target when we have confidence that we have continued function. Okay? Um, and so I'm going to say that that is perhaps incipient structural and non-structural damage. Okay? So I'm going to look at a design target that is described by uh, incipient damage to our, to our building. So we're going to use incipient damage as a surrogate for high confidence that we still have uh, continued function in our building. Um, to do that, we're going to, we're going to consider a, a limit state. We're going to define that based on a limit state of, of having essentially elastic behavior. Okay? Um, and I'm going to choose a risk target. Because I'm only talking about damage, I'm comfortable with saying it's a 50% probability. Uh, you might argue that, and, uh, and maybe we can look at different values. But for the sake of this uh, presentation, I'll talk about a 50% probability of exceeding essentially elastic behavior in 50 years. Um, and uh, again, we are going to follow the exact same process as before. We have a fragility curve now that's defining the essentially elastic behavior. Um, and uh, that's going to get integrated with our hazard curve. And we get some risk. Turns out, first of all, it's uh, too high. So again, we shift that fragility curve over. We get that risk down, and uh, we say good. And it turns out that, um, and, and sorry, then we pick the point on that fragility curve that defines that we're going to use for our design value. And that was actually picked in this case by a sort of sensitivity study. Um, but uh, that, that, uh, for the time being, that's what we're going to do. So that gives us our design SA. It turns out that that design SA now is just about at a 50 year return period off the hazard. And this is for one particular location in New Zealand. We repeated this for a bunch of different locations in New Zealand. And we get about the same. So that's convenient. It means that a 50-year return period is maybe what we should be using for our serviceability level design. Remember what I said we currently use in New Zealand is a 25. So this implies that we're probably uh, under uh, undercooking right now. Uh, maybe need to uh, move it up to about 50 years. So now we have a, uh, a, a spectral acceleration design value for ultimate limit state based on fatality risk and one for serviceability limit state based on uh, incipient damage risk. Okay? So the question is, is which one controls? Well, if we plot this ratio across the country, we see that most locations across the country are actually less than four. And four is relevant because that is the typical ductility value that's used in design, or your R value that's used in design 
at the NBC level. And so as a result, that's effectively the same as this ratio, right? And so what that means is that everything below four serviceability is going to control in the design following this process. Instead of an ultimate limit state, which is typical today when we use that 25 return for service. And this is really consistent with the general sense of the engineering community in New Zealand is that they're saying, why don't we design for a stronger building in the elastic range and then provide the ductility to, uh, and, and the capacity design to, to make sure we have good performance in the bigger. And this is sort of supporting that intuitive sense that the engineering community is coming to. And it's also supported by looking and comparing New Zealand outcomes with those in Japan. In Japan, typically they have designed for SLS and check ULS, the opposite of what we do in, in, uh, in New Zealand currently. And here I'm showing the um, uh, response spectrum uh, damage results for the Christchurch earthquake in black and the Kumamoto earthquake from Japan in red, uh, choosing the, the rugby colors in two different countries. Um, <laughs> and yeah, and, on the, and so you can see that this Kumamoto earthquake is a strong earthquake, larger than Christchurch on most periods. Um, and if we look at the damage here, and this is specifically damage to modern concrete buildings, okay, uh, modern code. Um, and you can see that both codes performed reasonably well in terms of life safety, right? But uh, you see that a large bar here under no damage, uh, essentially continued function in Japan. While in uh, New Zealand, we have a lot more that are sitting in this minor moderate range. Um, and uh, perhaps that is an outcome of this uh, design process. Of course, there's lots of other variables between the two. Uh, but importantly, when you have that outcome, you have a big difference in the outcome of the city, right? Komamoto, essentially everything functioning after the earthquake. Visited there uh, about uh, three months after the earthquake and the city was functioning as usual. Except for a few small pockets where there was specific damage. Christchurch, this is a picture taken uh, about two years after the earthquake, and you can see all of the empty lots where there used to be buildings, and many of the buildings that you see there in that picture have subsequently been uh, So a huge difference in performance between these two cities, perhaps tied to this uh, design uh, uh, approach. And so this is maybe a bit of evidence that uh, designing for this SLS and then checking ULS makes sense. Okay. What I've been talking about so far is just strength. And uh, strength, I think Cardi Cross said, while essential is otherwise unimportant. Uh, and it really is all about drift. It's all about deformations in your building that are important. To, to the damage and the performance. So let's turn our attention now to that. So uh, on the continued function side, uh, we're going to judge that uh, based on the uh, uh, drift critical or deformation critical uh, non-structural components. All right. And so we want to develop a risk-based drift check for those non-structural components. So let's take partitions. And we can choose damage state one or damage state two. Damage state one, I don't just leave alone. It's the uh, it's, it's same as my partitions in my house uh, uh, currently. So uh, I think uh, most people would be considering of damage state two as being relevant. So let's take, again, a 50% probability that will exceed uh, uh, damage state two in 50 years. Let's use that as our, as our risk target. Again, you may come back and, and uh, query whether that 50% was right, but uh, let's use that as a start. So 
Now we're, we're typically using SA, uh, spectral acceleration hazard curves. Uh, so but now we want it in terms of drift. Well, it's easy enough to convert that to uh, spectral acceleration hazard curve to spectral displacement, uh, easy enough. Uh, but we can also convert that to a drift hazard curve. Uh, just by thinking about the typical profile of a frame or a wall. And uh, there's some uh, good work by Miranda that indicates uh, the conversion from your spectral displacement to a, uh, a peak drift. That's all we've done here. So now we've got a drift-based hazard curve. And we can integrate that with our uh, uh, fragility for that damage state too, for the partition. And we get, when we do that, we get too high of a, uh, of a risk. And so that means we need to stiffen our billet. Um, we don't, in this case, we're not changing the partition fragility, that's staying the same. But because we're stiffening the building, we're actually changing the hazard. Okay, so the, sh the shift comes in the shift of the hazard. And so what this suggests is that at this 1 in 50, 50 year return period for uh, shaking, that we shouldn't go beyond a drift of about 0.7. So designed for a maximum story drift of 0.7 at a 50 year uh, shaking. You want to go to DS1, that would end up bringing you down to 0.3. So that's pretty small. There are other serviceability limits out there. There's one here for the LA Tall Buildings uh, Structural Design Council, of course, that's 0.5% in 43 years. So pretty similar. Uh, Japan has something similar. Um, and uh, Chile has 0.3% uh, uh, based on their reduced forces. Uh, unclear what return period that's uh, directly associated with. But when I look at these and I look at what's coming out of here, I think uh, around numbers, uh, a good proposal might be 0.5% in a 50 year shape. All right, so that gives us a risk targeted uh, design check, uh, drift check. Um, and that sort of fills in those two boxes. How about the last box? We said that was enable repair. So, at this point, I need to tear my voice. And here we need a definition. Because really, anything is repairable if you throw enough money at it. Right? So what I mean by repairable is that it does not require safety critical repairs to occupy. OK? The reason for that, and, and I need to further define that safety critical for me. What I mean by safety critical repair is a repair needed to restore strength or deformation capacity of my component. Okay? And the advantage of this is that it forces us to think about repairs that are relatively simple and therefore faster to implement uh, after an event. We're talking about Oxy ejection like this over here, not full replacement of a wall, uh, such as uh, this building in Chile. Um, we're unlikely to be fully functional at this point. Okay? This is still a significant amount of damage, but still safe to shelter in place. Okay? So it enables that occupancy of building uh, and sheltering in place, which is so critical to recover. I'm going to focus right now on the structural system. Uh, absolutely, if we move in this direction, we need to be thinking more carefully about non-structural systems. And I'll come back with a few comments on that. Okay, so in order to do this, we essentially need uh, component-based repairability limits. Um, and really what we're asking ourselves is to come up with these limits, is that uh, what deformation demand? Uh, would my component require these safety critical repairs? Or, put another way, is what do the prior cycles of that damaging earthquake, uh, what influence do they have on my strength and, uh, and deformation capacity? Okay? When do I need to worry about them? When do I need to worry about those prior cycles? 
All right, and to do that, uh, as uh, and, and here I'm going to show my bias of being a, a concrete researcher, uh, and, and I always enjoy doing things in the lab, so uh, I tend to, when asked this kind of question, I tend to go back to the lab data. Uh, and so we looked at a variety of lab data out there, um, and uh, I, I particularly like this set of tests by Kawashima and Koyama. Uh, back from 1988, uh, good old days. Um, and it tested uh, uh, identical bridge columns. Um, and one of those columns was subjected to 10 cycles at every drift level, and the other column was subjected to three cycles at every drift level. And what we saw was that up to about three delta Y, uh, the, the, the behavior, even the damage patterns, were very, very similar. But after that, uh, they started to differentiate. Uh, even the damage patterns started to differentiate, and the, and the 10 cycles started to drop off faster. What is that 3 delta Y? Well, it's basically the peak in the backbone. Okay, but when we started to get degradation. Okay, and so this seems to suggest that the number of cycles did not matter as long as we were before the peak in the response. Okay. Then uh, some wall tests. Uh, this was done by a graduate student of mine at, uh, at Auckland. And the first test he did, he took a uh, wall and subjected it to your standard cyclic protocol to fail. And then the next one he took and imposed uh, basically like a poor man's hybrid. He just took an analysis of a building and extracted the, the, uh, the, the drift demand of that wall and subjected his wall to the drift demands from a long Chile earthquake uh, and then subjected it to the same uh, uh, standard cyclic protocol. And what we see is not much difference, right? That basically that prior earthquake had, did not really influence uh, the behavior because it didn't push it past the peak. So the number of cycles did not matter until bar buckling or the peak of strength was reached. Um, then, of course, my grad student wanted to prove me wrong. I said, what if we take 10 cycles at 1.5% drift? And on that 10th cycle, we got bar buckling. And so, yes. It had some impact. It did reduce our deformation capacity. But for me, this just emphasizes the importance of considering the uncertainty in the behavior. And, and also that this is a pretty significant demand, 10 cycles at 1.5%. So this seems to suggest a, a repairability. And, and, and this is really quite a simple concept. And, um, but uh, the idea is that if we have an earthquake that pushes our building like this green uh, cycle here, so it hasn't gone past the peak, that that maybe when the next earthquake comes along has just reduced the stiffness of our building, right? Our stiffness has gone down. But not much else. We still go get up to that full the peak strength of the build uh, that we expected from that from that uh, component to that building. But if that building was so unlucky to get a third of it after it's gone past the peak, now you're no longer getting back up to that peak strength, quite obviously. Right? And so those prior cycle the prior cycles will influence uh, the strength and deformation capacity for when it goes past. Okay, uh, so if the demand from the damaging earthquake has pushed it past that uh, peak strength or, or delta V max, then you, those safety critical repairs are going to be needed. Otherwise, we just have a reduction in stiffness. And that sort of implies that that drift V max maybe is our repair mode. And this I would say, hold on a second. You just said that you had reduced stiffness. Isn't that a problem? If we have reduced stiffness, don't we get an amplification in our drifts and future effects? 
And you're not even thinking about those number of cycles that the building has gone through. Isn't that going to cause some premature failure of our, uh, of our reinforcement due to low cycle fatigue? Okay, so let's just take those two considerations um, uh, one at a time. And at this point in a talk, I always need a, a video to, to wake people up. So let's see how this will work. So this is a 10-story building that was tested at E-Defense. John, you may even, even have taken this video, I don't know. Uh, I, I was there as well, but somebody else took the video shared it. Um, and so this was running uh, this 10-story building with Kobe Earthquake. All right, let's try that again. All right, so um, they ran the built an earthquake. It was really loud. Uh, and uh, they got uh, pretty significant drifts. You may not have been able to tell uh, directly from, from as far away, but there's uh, quite, a, quite a bit of drift. Um, and then they ran the exact same motion again. You might say, you just cheated. You just played the same video twice. And yes, I did. Because if I had shown you two videos of those two tests, we wouldn't have double top difference. Because they were pretty much identical. In fact, if we plot the peak drift uh, from run one versus the peak drift from run two, in both directions, this is a frame in this direction, wall in that direction, they're almost identical. And uh, Santiago Pujol from the University of Canterbury collected data from a whole bunch of shape tests, um, some just single degree of freedom, some multi degree of freedom, not many as big as this multi degree of freedom, but still. And they follow that general trend. Yes, they're scattered about that one to one line, but they follow that general trend. There's a few outliers, uh, and a lot of those outliers are cases where there was degradation and building damage. In other words, uh, the, the components had gone past the peak, okay? So those are ones where we expect to see amplification in drifts in the subsequent ground motion. Um, so this is essentially suggesting that the prior damage does not increase the drift, okay? as long as there was no uh, degradation in run one. Wow, that's, 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 uh, that's quite something, and uh, and very important finding for what we're talking about here. How about this low cycle fatigue issue? Well, low cycle fatigue is often tested by putting a bar in a testing machine and cycling it until it fails, right? Um, and, uh, and you get data like this shown here that relates the strain that you might have applied, uh, that, you, that you applied during the test, that constant strain you were applying, um, to the number of cycles of failure, okay? And um, you get uh, data like this plotted on, uh, on log one. And uh, you get models that go through that, uh, such as shown there. And I've bolded in a few points here that have a small S over DBE ratio, because I particularly want to focus on those cases that don't see buckling while you're cycling it back and forth. Because remember, we're looking at a state prior to buckling. Okay? So looking particularly at those cases where we're not seeing buckling. So S over DB uh, less than four, uh, I guess it's about this line. Okay, now we're gonna say, what does a typical earthquake give us in terms of the demand? And uh, you might debate what a peak strain might be, uh, during an earthquake, and I was going to ask Professor Wallace, what do you think of pick strain? You had to pick one strain, a wall uh, that you would use um, for a typical design basis earthquake. 
2%. Oh, that sounds good. How about 5%? That's pretty high, right? 5% is pretty high. So uh, let's say 5% up there. And then uh, that puts us a box down to about 30. It turns it out that 30 here is uh, about a mean plus one standard deviation of the number of cycles or equivalent cycles that we get for one big subduction record followed by one crustal record. Um, the equivalent number of cycles at this peak strain would be about 30. And so that means most modern, most earthquake loading. And the reason why I put two earthquakes there is I'm testing whether I'm happy for this building to go through another, right? So I need it to be for two earthquakes. Um, so it means that most earthquake loading is going to fall in this box that's below this line for uh, a bar that has a buckle. So typically, low cycle fatigue is not going to be an issue for, um, for uh, bars that have not buckled. All right. So uh, I'm just going to modify my description of my repairability limit by saying it's the drifted Vmax or bar buckling. Um, uh, but that, that, I, I think that, that limit sounds, um, sounds pretty reasonable. So what sort of numbers do we get? for that repair bell. Thinking about ductile beams in the first instance, um, a collection of data for that, um, we uh, tend to get somewhere around 3.5% uh, is the median. Um, and, uh, but you can see a fair bit of scatter. But interestingly enough, as long as you're less than six, uh, um, and that's over dB of six, uh, which is required by code, you don't really get a trend with S over EB. Uh, they all tend to be about uh, in the same, well, the same scatter. Um, looking over here for ductile walls, this is some data from uh, John and his student, uh, Saman. Um, and we see again uh, scatter, but at this time, there's this trend with this uh, parameter that, uh, that is related to the uh, axial load. On the on the wall, um, just to sort of pick off some numbers for you to bear in mind as we continue on here. Let's just look at the lower bounds for each of these. The lower bound for ductile beams is about two percent. The lower bound for typical axial loads, not the really high axial loads, uh, is about one and a half percent or so. Okay, um, so just remember those numbers. We'll come back to those. Okay, so that's the data. Um, but when we pick a repairability limit for design, we need to think more than just the uncertainty in the data uh, in the test. We need to think about uh, uncertainty in the design construction, uh, record record variability, model variability. Well, these are all laid out in other documents, such as FEMA P695 and FEMA P58. I won't go into them. But it's chose a few of those sort of typical values here. Um, and essentially what I want to do, those will help me define a, um, a distribution for my demand and capacity. And essentially what I want to do is shift my demand up until all these guys intersect, providing uh, a uh, probability of exceeding a repairability limit to some given target. And then the median on my demand, that's my uh, limit for my rotation. And I've already used my one equation, right? So I'm not going to go through the equations for this, but instead just jump to uh, the, 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 the results. Um, so this is showing you the probability of it being repairable for different beam rotation lines, all right? Using uh, that, that process I just, uh, or the uncertainties that I showed you on the previous slide. Uh, and the same thing for ductile walls, except here, of course, they, they depend on the axial load uh, or they depend on the flammable. Um, and so I could pick, you know, what, what rotation limit should I use from this? Uh, you can pick any value you want, so it's just based on the, the uh, uh, uncertainty or the uh, probability that you choose, right? Well, Let's make it simple and choose 
And I like that because it gives me back those lower bound values that I got from the, from the data plots before. So it just gives me some comfort. So uh, a uh, repairability limit of 2% for the beams, a repairability limit of 1.3% uh, for the lightly loaded walls. Okay, now that's just for the component. Uh, how about the building? Um, so let's take two buildings. And in this case, I'm going to take a frame in New Zealand, uh, or a real building that went through the Kaipur earthquake um, over here, and a, uh, a wall building in LA. This one, however, is fictitious. You can probably tell by it's a typical uh, academic building with uh, uh, far too ready for a real building. Um, but still, it's a good example because we have some data that we can we can test it against, um, test and model it, so we can develop some confidence in our model. So we've done that in both cases. We have some confidence in this model. We do some nonlinear analysis, and here I'm going to skip over all of the details of doing that nonlinear analysis and go straight to the uh, results from from the multiple strike analysis. Um, and uh, again, this is the frame over here and the wall on the right. And if we look at focusing on uh, that repairability limit of 2% and 1.3%, um, we find that for the walls, sorry, for the beams, about 25% exceed that limit. But when we've done this kind of nonlinear analysis, we're really only looking for a median to to, to meet this. So that's, that's still meeting. Um, and uh, for the walls, we only have 15% of seating. So what was doing even better? So basically what this uh, implies is that our current designs are really satisfying this repairability limit for DB. So we're already most of the way there. And if we take it out, case of the wall, we can also compare the collapse fragility and the fragility that results for a stage of requiring these safety critical repairs. What's interesting here is that that collapse fragility meets that 10% probability of collapse in the MCE because it was designed to that uh, uh, based on the, the, the US code it was designed to. Um, but what's interesting is that the, uh, the same wall uh, meets this state of requiring safety critical repairs at uh, of 10% at the DB. A bit of an analogy. So the building designed to achieve a 10% probability of uh, collapse of the MZE has the same 10% probability of requiring safety critical repairs in the DB. That's, that's, that's kind of appealing, and, uh, but this is just one building, uh, and it would be nice to explore the relationship between these two and whether this consistency kind of holds, uh, because that would provide a relationship with uh, collapse to this point of, um, of this uh, safety critical repairs. Um, and part of the reason for that is that I think if we come back to that idea of acknowledging uncertainty that we talked about before in the context of, of uh, this ultimate limit state, um, we're, we're often talking about collapse way out here. The performance out there is very uncertain. Uh, and what I'm suggesting is that maybe we should be thinking about this point of repairable damage, which is at the peak. And the reason why that's so attractive is that when we think about the uncertainty in the analysis, the uncertainty in the analysis increases tremendously as we go out to those large damage states, right? And move out to try to predict collapse. And there's far less uncertainty before we get degradation. In other words, at this repairable level. So that has its attraction. And if we can, uh, find a link between these two that typically holds, and we can also get that confidence if we're designing for that repairable limit, we're getting that collapse 
you're probably getting that glass performance limit. But there's more to the, the uh, repairability limit than just that. It gives us a lot more. It gives us some climate change. Because if we think about the embodied carbon in our uh, impacts of our, um, from our buildings, there's a tremendous benefit that comes from being able to repair these. This is a plot that shows the carbon uh, cost uh, due to a design basis. Okay, 475 years old. Um, and what it's showing uh, is, and then uh, note the scale goes way out to this two million. Okay, this is three hundred thousand. Two million, way out there. And that black line is essentially all the carbon costs from demolishing the building. And this comes from the fact that at a design basis earthquake, there is a probability that you're going to need to demolish that building because of damage. Right? So as long as you have that probability that you're going to need to demolish the building, I'm guessing. The next part of the rinks is the damage due to non-structural, sorry, uh, um, is due to non-structural damage. So this is the next segment uh, that caused that, that uh, has carbon impacts. And this little sliver down here is a carbon impact due to the structural damage, as long as we don't need to demolish. Okay? So there seems that this is a pretty clear indication that if we can design for repairability and we can avoid this need for demolition, uh, then we're also going to benefit climate change. And, but, it, but it seems complicated. Uh, isn't this a huge change to our design approach? Really, the design process stays the same. And here I have to recognize that in, in, in the U.S. you do not have a serviceability limit at state, and so I'm, I'm bringing that in. That is new. Uh, but you do have it within your LA tall buildings, so perhaps you're getting used to it a bit. Um, and uh, you don't check deformations in all cases uh, for um, your uh, design basis, but you now do in some cases, such as structural walls, so, and still, the design process that I'm suggesting here has not changed significantly. Uh, but what this process does do is it forces you to think about post earthquake repair throughout the design process. Okay? And it makes you think about how you approach your non structural components. And, you know, we have non structural components that allow us to access. You know, the pipes within the building. So we know when a, a pipe is burst and such. Why don't we have this kind of hatch to look at our structural components that might be damaged after an earthquake? So we can go inspect them without having to tear out all those non structural finishes just to say it's not damaged. Uh, so focus on non structural systems that support that uh, repairability and in turn, Functionality. All right, this is the last couple of slides. We, uh, let me try to pull all these pieces together. We've talked about uh, a uh, SLS uh, continued function uh, targets. We've talked about ULS protect life tar uh, design targets. We've talked about enable work. Um, and uh, let me just sort of walk through or summarize what we've talked about uh, and Sort of see how I've, I, I've tried to meet these objectives of the talk that I laid out in the beginning. So, first of all, I wanted to recognize the inherent uncertainties in seismic performance. Uh, and we've done that by setting risk targets for each of these. Okay, you might debate exactly what those risk targets are, but they are a recognition of the uncertainties involved and make us take into consideration those uncertainties. Then, I've said I want my implementation to be as simple as possible. Well, those risk targets may be seem complex, but our design targets that come out of the process are actually quite simple and very similar to what we have today. And so this is really a small increment of change. And there I say for New Zealand because of the fact that uh, we already have this SLS uh, check deformation 
Um, but uh, that is a relatively small change, and it's even smaller when we recognize that for the most part, we get the ULS for free, right? Because the SLS is controlling. We, can't, we don't even need that. Well, it's not entirely for free. We still need capacity design and ductility in our components to be able to go to those large uh, uh, demands. So it's really SLS plus possibilities. All right, but in all of this, what the, the structure is set up to try to address these impacts that we've observed from past events. And now there is an indirect connection between the building performance. We recognize that from all of these impacts. But if we can recognize that building performance and design for the damage that happens, Perhaps we can improve these impacts in future events. Okay? And special for you today, I added one last thing, and that is a relationship to functional recovery. Because I know functional recovery is the, the buzz term uh, here in the US now, uh, and, and for good reason. Uh, it is a, a, uh, a state uh, that um, would benefit. Uh, the recovery of the overall community, if we can achieve functional recovery. So, in a sense, let me try to align these, these, these targets here with functional recovery. Well, this SLS one is essentially based on incipient damage. Uh, in other words, we said that was a surrogate for high confidence in continued function. And we're not actually measuring whether we're continuing to function, but we have a high confidence that we will be able to function if we don't, if we're before uh, significant damage or, or uh, on the edge of the uh, The enable repair is based on a repairable damage. Um, so, and that we said, well, you will likely not require safety critical repairs to occupy. And occupancy is an important aspect to, to recover. So these are all linked with this uh, concept of functional recovery, but you'll note that there's no time to return to function in what F laid out. And that's because of recognizing uncertainty and acknowledging uncertainty. There's a huge uncertainty in estimating those times to return to function. And a lot of those times to return to function are controlled by factors beyond the control of the design, specifically of the building. And so, but my sense is that we, if we have a focus on damage, this focus on second damage, repairable damage, uh, well, we're still focused on reducing that time to return to function. Okay? While we have not used it directly within our calculations, uh, that this focus will reduce our time to return to function as is. Plastic. So I've talked about designing based on a service earthquake and then checking the repair limits in the design based earthquake as providing a simple means of uh, reducing post earthquake uh, impacts and providing you with a high confidence that you'll be able to meet those functionality targets, those collapse targets, and even life cycle carbon targets. Um, and we've demonstrated that. Current structural designs are actually pretty close to being repairable as they are. So it feels to me like it's a time for us to change our focus from a ductility based design to a repairability. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, my question is on your last slide where you kind of came together in the context of functional recovery. Is this relation based on structural damage alone, or does this take into account down to structural damage as well? No. Good question. Um, as we went through the process, this stimulus limit here, so my drift limit at SLS, is non structural based. Um, on the enable repair, 
I uh, completely acknowledge that the process that I've taken uh, uh, in the first go around of this is to uh, is a focus on the structure. But my sense is that, as I said, uh, the structure that we have right now might be pretty close to being repairable as it is. But if we change our mindset that we're designing for repairability, then that's going to change the mindset and how we approach that. And so it's more, I, I think it's more about changing that mindset about how we approach the not structural that's critical as opposed to a particular uh, deformation target. Whatnot. Any other questions? Um, first of all, I would like to say that it's very good um, presentation and uh, it's very informative. Uh, there's a lot of knowledge that um, it's very hard to grasp like in, uh, in a short time. Uh, but I wanted to ask like about the, the fragilities that you have shown. Uh, 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 I don't know, like you, you mentioned about the range of fragilities on one of the slides. So is that range capturing the epistemic uncertainty on those fragilities or you know, what is that? Right, yeah, good question. Um, it's capturing the range. Um, not every building that's designed according to code is critical. Right, uh, and there's uh, in reality is not every building designed according to code actually will be captured by one. So what we did is we thought about what is that range of possible agilities that would result from a code conforming. And I acknowledge that we developed these fragilities largely based on uh, judgment, uh, but with some looks back to what analysis tells us, okay? and what performance in past events tells us. Well, that's, that's limited because these are cops. Um, and, and so, and I didn't show you the fragilities here, but basically we have a set of fragilities that are defined based on a range of collapse to merchant ratios that will be true of New Zealand. So those are the fragilities that I'm referring to. We were ran those through uh, for part uh, of the hazard curves from those locations, and that was the range. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can I ask one more question? Um, so, after these uh, recent earthquakes in Turkey, um, the, the ERI, the LFPT, who were there, and uh, uh, so one of the professors uh, uh, from Purdue, uh, uh, Professor Ifano or Ihan Ifano, yep, 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 uh, at the end of his presentation, he mentioned uh, that um, these detailing requirements for ductility are too much for some countries to handle. Like we, uh, we have seen like in all of these earthquakes that we uh, we haven't been able to comply in most of these countries. And uh, he said like we should start building stiffer buildings. Uh, what what is your comment on that. Uh, I definitely agree with the stiffer buildings. Uh -huh. um, however, I think that we still need to, if uh, if it's feasible within a uh, country's capacity, uh, that we still need to provide that uh, tactile detail. Because uh, one thing these earthquakes have taught us is that we can we don't know what earthquakes are. So, uh, strong it's going to be uh, and um, they always have surprises. And by having that ductile detailing, capacity design, uh, that uh, we, we have that robustness uh, to, 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 to give us likely better performance in that very large. So while I definitely believe in the stiffer, that's going to uh, help you meet those uh, tight drift limits for serviceability that I was talking about. Um, uh, you still need that, that document. Um, this is kind of like your first half of the presentation, but um, in New Zealand, based on, correct me if I'm wrong, um, it's currently a 1 in 25 year SLS, but you're pushing for the 1 in 50 year. Do you foresee a lot of pushback from, you know, because I imagine there's rising initial costs, but there might be savings, I guess, in terms of repairability. Um, in terms of pushing it to the law, was there any pushback that you 
or they encountered or how you Fine. Then it's, uh, this is, as I said at the beginning, these are crazy amusing things. <laughs> Uh, I've yet to uh, face those, uh, but I absolutely expect to face uh, that. Uh, particularly right now, uh, you're facing the same tightening of purse rings that uh, you are here. Um, and so it, 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 it will take uh, some convincing. However, um, there, there are several things in our favor. Uh, first off is the net zero uh, on targets. Uh, and, and by framing this in the context of uh, those net zero targets as well, is, is going to be beneficial. Um, the other is that we're in a period of heightened uh, seismicity in, uh, in New Zealand. Uh, and so there's constant reminders of earthquakes. Um, and um, uh, the other is that in the end, that 25 years doesn't control. In our current design, right? It's it's, it's too low, to and so um, it's really not uh, not much of an impact to start moving it up. And we already had a big boost in our overall our new seismic hazard model has uh, brought up the seismicity in, uh, in, in many locations by factor of two or four. Uh, and so we've already had a big boost in the ULS. Uh, so to bring up the SLS sort of to match. If um, is, is probably not unnecessary, but uh, I'll uh, stay tuned. Uh, I, I'm sure a few tomatoes will come out. Probably want to talk to the lenders first. I'm sure they would appreciate. It. <laughs> I mean, one one aspect is that, um, as I said before, there's high insurance penalties, and and insurance. It's always been frustrated by the fact that the building code is focused on life safety. Uh, and so uh, taking a focus on damage will actually be of interest to insurance. There may be some additional costs, but uh, it'll, it'll start to, to focus on the things that matter. Just a quick question. Um, not too much experience designing, but um, when you say so when you just face it off the Scythian damage, wouldn't that just be bigger? Uh, it basically means uh, stiffer. Uh, so when I say incipient damage, I mean, there's a term here uh, that's often used here, essentially elastic. That means uh, you, you can allow a little bit of yielding, but it's essentially elastic. Um, and so that's the performance state. That I don't want to go beyond. And that's uh, for, for this. Or so what I'm saying is, so then this would require just like bigger, it, uh, bigger elements for all your buildings. No, not, not necessarily, because it depends on for what earthquake or what level of shaking you want that uh, design to, uh, that target. And this is for only uh, 500. Sorry. 50 year return. Okay, you're, you're, you're designing, you take a 20 risk based 2,500, let's just call it 2,500 divided by two thirds. That gets you back to somewhere around a return period of 475 uh, to 500, roughly speaking. Uh, I know here in LA it's a bit different because you determine the count, but anyway, let's just watch that for a moment. Um, and so this is a lot. Right? So we're saying at this level of shading, 50 year return period shade, we want to be just getting a little bit. Okay. Right? Maybe a little stupid, but uh, somewhere I lost that. Where did the probability of fatality or casualty go? Yeah. It's all here. And the reason why I said you get this for free. Is that this is essentially a strength check, right? Uh, and and uh, what I showed earlier was that if you compare this value at its reduced forces, right? Because we in New Zealand we designed it to buy by KMU, which is equal to mu, the ductility. Here you divide by R, uh, but we when we divide by uh, KMU, 
that tends to turn out to be the same or lower than this value for serviceability. So in other words, if we design for this, we get this regarding the method. Does that make sense? Uh, so, so, if you, so if you design for this, you've already met this, uh, this target for uh, fake algorithm. Yeah, but the non-structural elements following and killing people, you know. Yeah, and so you're still going to need to have the requirements around anchoring of non-structural components. But in terms of the strength of the building, uh, it's, that's bad. That's that. And you might say, well, what about drift? Well, drift is captured here. The difference you have. Uh, so what I understand from your presentation is with, with the 25-year return period, uh, the first part is not really activated. Like it is, it is just like a redundant thing. Then it's all here. Yeah. But when we go to the 50 years, we will be using more of this um, and we'll be checking against that, right? And, and, and the other sort of addition that we've made in the SLS space that we don't currently have in New Zealand is the stiffness. In New Zealand, uh, SLS is basically, there's, there's a few deformations for like checks, but it's essentially a, a strength check. How did you get that eighty percent probability of? Is it like the that? Uh, how did you set that limit? <laughs> I made it up. Um, just like the age fifty percent in fifty years. I feel like. um, it's just in order to have some some uh, um, target uh, to 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 base things on, but. but to me, um, the, having these here allows us to debate what is appropriate. Okay? Uh, I can't tell you what's exactly appropriate, but um, this is a start. And that's essentially what happened in, in the process of, of choosing our current design levels, is that we said, well, what, what, what should be our, our risk? So we use 1% probability of collapse in 50 years, like in the US, and the sense was, that sounds high. Um, and uh, do we have any other parameters to go on? Well, a lot of sectors use fatalities. That's what could have done. What numbers should we use? All kinds of numbers. So there's a range. That's where we are. Thanks for this. It's nice to have a discussion after the talk as opposed to uh, walking out.